So verse 17, Nehemiah 2, verse 17, Then I said, Nehemiah speaking, speaking to the people who were discouraged, distressed, lost their sense of uh, hope. They were uh, a sense of security uh, was taken away because of the walls broken down. So Nehemiah is, is here to rebuild the broken down walls, rebuild uh, the burnt gates. And he's speaking to these people who are discouraged, who um, have no peace of mind, concern about the enemy having access in and out. So hear what Nehemiah said to these people, the Israelites, the Jews. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. That's quite interesting. Nehemiah is speaking to these people and I want you to see what Nehemiah said. Remember, Nehemiah was not living in Jerusalem. He was back in Shushan working as a cupbearer. He had a good job. Well, we can say good job because he was close to the king. And he had a good relationship with the king because he tasted his food, his drink. That made him uh, to have a good relationship, uh, a good rap with the, uh, the king. So he was living in Shushan comfortably, and now he is in Jerusalem trying to rebuild. So he was not living there. But look what he said. Then I said to them, you see the distress that who are in? We. we. He included himself. He said, we are in this together. If you are hungry, I'm hungry. If you are sad, I'm sad. If you are concerned about the security of, the, of Jerusalem, I'm concerned too. He said, you see the distress that we are in. We are in this together. He included himself. How Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come. Let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. He's telling them, let's not sit down and cry anymore. Let's rise up and do something about the problem. Are you seeing this so far? He's telling them, he's going over the problem. He said, I know the problem. I know what's wrong. I know the issue. I know the difficulties. I know the condition Jerusalem is in. But he said, uh, sitting down and crying won't help. Complaining won't help. Uh, being afraid of the enemy having access in and out won't help. He said, come, let us build. Let's do something positive about the issue. Does it make sense? He's saying, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Underline the word reproach. Back up in the verse, underline the word or highlight the word distress. Then I said to them, you see the distress, the distress. Let's look at the word distress and let's see what it means, distress. Let's look at distress. It means bad, affliction, calamity, displease, grief, harm, hurtful and misery. You see, I like misery. You see the misery we are in. Now, hurricane, what's the hurricane before Milton? Hurricane that destroyed a lot of homes and businesses in hurricane, Elaine. Huh? Elaine. Elaine, Helene, whatever, okay. Well, the hurricane before Milton did some damages in Florida uh, the Carolinas and parts of Georgia. Now, those people this morning are in misery. Do you know what it's like to not have your comfortable bed to lay in? You're not able to get up in the morning, walk to the refrigerator, open and have a cold drink. 
no longer. That's misery. It's not comfortable. It's not nice. Now, those of you who have never experienced a hurricane, let me say this. I have, and I know what it's like. I know what it's like for the entire roof of my house to be gone, windows blown out, the entire house is soaked. All I had in a, in a plastic bag, my brother and I, was the clothes that we were able to save. That's all we had. I was 17 years of age. So I know the misery of a hurricane. Now, Nehemiah is telling them here, he said, Then I said to them, You see the distress. Let's stay right there. You see the distress. You see the misery. It's obvious. It is too obvious. It, it's all, you see, the entire Jerusalem is broken down. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned. You are concerned about the enemy having easy access in and out. Your peace of mind is gone. Now we are facing misery. He said, you see. You can't tell me, you know, it's too obvious. Now, we are rebuilding the church after COVID-19, and you see the empty seats, not only at embassy, but many other churches. It's too obvious. Every pastor is complaining. I spoke to a pastor in Anguilla. I spoke to a pastor in Trinidad. I spoke to a pastor in the Virgin Islands. I'm speaking to a pastor in Jamaica, and the concern is the people are staying home. They don't have the passion, the drive anymore. Why? COVID-19 spoil them. Made them too comfortable in staying at home in their PJs, the pajamas, to watch church life. And for me, I want to be in the midst of the fire. I want to be here when, when Jeffrey say amen, I can say, brother, preach on. I want, <laughs> I want to be here when Josephine said, preach, Odie, preach. I want to feel the power of God. Yes. There is something when we come together in person. And Nehemiah said, you see the distress we are in, the misery. This is for sure misery. Look around. The walls are broken down, city gates are burnt, the enemy has easy access in and out, you have lost your peace of mind, I am guaranteed to say to everybody that is misery. And right now the church is facing misery. We have Christians who claim they have a solid, bona fide relationship with God. They are comfortable in staying at home and have no interest in coming into the house of God to fellowship with the rest of the saints that make a big difference. That's misery for the church today. They don't know, but they are hurting the body of Christ, especially the one they are assigned to by God. It's misery. And the church leaders are crying out, come back to the house of God. I listen to Pastor Dr. J David Jeremiah weekly. And every Friday when he closes out his radio program, he's going to say, I'm going to do it again. Encourage you to go to church this weekend. We have been long staying away from church because of COVID. Go back to your church. He does it every Friday. He says, let me remind you, go back to church this Sunday. And Nehemiah is saying, the church needs people today who are going to see the obvious misery that COVID did to the body of Christ. Whether you believe it or not, COVID did a number to the body of Christ. Yes. And that's misery. And we are the ones to say, I see the misery. I see uh, Sister John is no longer here. I see Brother Tom is no longer here. I see the empty seats because of so and so who are no longer coming because they have lost the interest. The church is facing a misery in that position. Nehemiah said, then I said to them, you see, I, I don't have to hold your hand and walk you to the walls and the gates. You, it's obvious. 
You see the ones who used to shout and say amen and preach on and whatever the case may be. You don't see them anymore. That's misery for the body of Christ. You see the distress, the misery that we are in. And guess what? It, we, we are in this together. We are in this together. Whether you come or not, you staying away or hurting the body of Christ that you belong to. And that's why Nehemiah said to them, you see the distress that we are in. What is the distress? What's the misery? Here's the misery. How Jerusalem lies waste. So he's outlining the problem. He's outlining the issue. Now, they know what the issue is. They know what the problem is. But sometimes you have to speak it out and remind people. He said, how Jerusalem lies waste, one. Number two. And it's, they know the gates are burnt with fire. But he's letting them know, let me bring to the forefront of your mind one more time the issue that we are facing that is putting us in a place of misery this morning. He said, the gates are burned with fire. Two things. Gates are burned with fire. The walls are broken down. So he's reminding the people. He said, here is the problem. Here where we are. We are facing misery. Then he said, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue to stay at home? Are we going to continue to complain? Uh, I'm going to say it one more time. I'm not going to say it again, 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 again at all. I am, I am surprised to see how people are still using COVID-19 to stay at home, not coming to the house of God, but they're going to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and, and COVID doesn't exist those five days at work. Sure. COVID only exists on a Sunday morning for two hours. I am baffled. I am confused. Maybe I'm a little slow to comprehend what's going on. But that is not good. That's putting the church in a place of misery. You are saying your God cannot protect you from whatever you are running from, but you are still going out five days, uh, eight hours a day at somebody's job, and you are absent from the house of God on a Sunday morning. That's misery. He said, you see... The misery that we are in. Jerusalem lies waste. What lies waste? The church today lies waste. Believe it or not. It's not only Odie complaining and begging the folks to come back. It's all over America, all over the Caribbean islands, Canada, America, Africa. It's all over England. The pastors are saying, come back. And the, and the saints of God, those who know God and hear from God the most, they're doing this. Yeah, no, no, I don't want to hear that. I'm watching from home. I'm comfortable in my PJ. The ones that hear from God the most are the ones who are not coming into the house of God. But they have a word for me. The point is, you are undisciplined to obey God's word that says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together with the saints of God. You are disobeying that commandment in the word of God. He says, look, he says, Jerusalem lies waste. The church of God today in America, Caribbean Islands, England, Africa, Australia, all around the world, lies waste today because of COVID-19. And the children of God, the people of God, the saints of God refuse to rise up and say, no, it's time for us to rebuild the church after COVID-19. They refuse to do that. I remember the day, I still remember where I was, what I was doing, when my phone rang and the name popped up, Tamika. 
church, because I have your name saved as Leah Neighbor Church, Tamika Church, Jeffrey Turner Church. That's how I have your name saved in my phone. So if I'm somewhere in public, David, and Josephine called me and it pops up Josephine, I don't want it only to say Josephine. I want it to say Josephine Turner Church. I want it to say Tamika Church. Leah Church, because if I'm in public and somebody's looking at my phone and they see all three ladies called, they're like, oh, he's a womanizer. <laughs> so I like the church addition to it. So they know, oh, they're church brothers and sisters. Amen. Does it make sense? There's, there's a method to my madness, okay? <laughs> so I remember where I was, what I was doing when, when Tamika called Josephine and said, it's time for me to return to the house of God. Amen. She said, it's not the same at home. And she's been back ever since and has not stopped. God bless you, Tamika. Everybody say, God bless you, Tamika. God bless you, Tamika. Thank you for coming back. He said, how Jerusalem lies waste. The body of Christ today around the world lies waste because the saints of God, the Christians, the believers, refuse to take a stand and say, no, I am no longer going to stay in my bedroom on a Sunday morning, but I'm going to be disciplined enough to go back to the house of God in person to fellowship with the saints of God, to bring a smile on somebody's face when they see my face in the place. He said, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned. How, how, how are you so comfortable as a believer, as a Christian, that hears from God, prays to God, reads God, read God's word? How are you so comfortable on and, 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 and so many Sunday mornings just absent from the house of God, and it doesn't bother you? How are you comfortable? Where is your conscience? Where, where is your conscience? Like I said last week, you have no heart. Yes, class? He says, he says, look, how Jerusalem lies waste. How the body of Christ today lies waste. And that's why we are attempting to rebuilding the church after COVID-19. But to do that, for us to do that, we must have, as I said last week, the heart of Nehemiah, the mind of Nehemiah, and one more, and the spirit of Nehemiah. Let's say it together, class, to rebuild the church after COVID-19, you must have the mind, heart, and spirit of Nehemiah. You have to get, you have to have that deep on the inside of you. If you're going to be disciplined enough to say, on a Sunday morning, I'm going to get myself out of this house and go to the house of God. Amen. Why are you looking at me like I just got off the boat? No, I just came from my house, not a boat. Yes, class? Yes. We, listen, to do this, we got to fight to do this. Takes hard work to come every Sunday morning and you don't see Sister John, you don't see Sister Pat, you don't see Brother Tom, you don't see Brother Patrick. It, it bothers you somehow. Yes. You're wondering, how, are, are they still saved? Are they still with the Lord? It's a question I pose my, to myself at times. And many other pastors and, and, and brothers and sisters in the assemblies are asking, are they still with the Lord? Amen. Amen. Nehemiah says, the gates are burned with fire. And he said, let's not just sit down and talk about it, gossip about it, point about it, whisper about it. He said, let's do something about it. It's going to require everybody at embassy to do something about the empty seats and pray and believe God for those who are still home, still not comfortable yet, or have the motivation and the drive to come back in person for us to pray them into the house of God.
let's not just sit back and cry or complain. Nehemiah said, after he laid out the problem, after he reminded them the city gates are burned, the walls are destroyed, he said, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to sit down and cry and every day look out for the enemy and run and hide? He said, no. He said, let's do something about it. And hear this, saints, hear this embassy, we are going to do something about it. What are we going to do? We are going to discipline ourselves that every Sunday morning, unless you are sick unto death, you come into the house of God. You know what sick unto death means? You barely can put one foot in front of the other. You can barely get out of your bed. You're weak. Even your bone is weak. Yes? Yeah. One day, a lady didn't feel too good, Tamika. But she was good enough to still come to the house of God. And she was going to stay home. And then she said to me, after this whole shebang, she said, I had to press my way to come to the house of God. Because you raised the standard. You took the bar to a whole different level. So I'm listening to how did I take the bar to a whole different level, Josephine. She said, this man took a gunshot to his foot and still in the house of God on a Sunday. During the week, right after I got injured, the first question my nephew, David, who just played the keyboard, he didn't ask me, how are you doing, uncle? How's your foot, uncle? He asked me, are we having church Sunday? <laughs> His first concern. He wanted a break. Well, there's no break for the house of God. Amen? I said, we're having church. The Sunday when I got injured, I put on some sandals and I went to work Monday morning. My neighbor, who did a sermon this morning, called no name, get no blame. She said, you, you need to stay home and rest your foot. My sister, you need to elevate your foot. Listen, <laughs> you're going to make money. She's going to make money, but I must stay home elevating my foot and they're not going to give me the money they're making. So what should I do, Jeffrey? Huh? I think I'm going to make my own money. I think I'm going, to, I, I'm going to hop along and make my own money. What's my point? What's my, unless you are sick unto death, unless it's, it's, it's a dire need that you can't move, you can't do anything, then you say, I, I'm absent today from the house of God. And we understand. It's going on two months now. And every Sunday I'm here Amen. preaching and declaring God's word regardless of how I feel. Amen. No, excuse. no excuse. I am here. So because I took a gunshot and in the house of God still preaching and, and didn't use that as an excuse. And some, some of you would have used it as an excuse. Well, Pastor, you're not going to see me for a couple of Sundays. Because I got shot in my foot, Pastor. And I got arrested. I got to elevate it. it. Man, listen, you got enough time to elevate it all night, eight hours. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, listen, I want you to understand. Listen to me. Tamika, I want you to get the understanding of what I'm trying to communicate. There are some things we have to take serious if we're ever going to see positive, optimistic results. And we have to be consistent in what we do. And building a church from scratch and being consistent every Sunday requires discipline and requires three things. The mind, heart, and Spirit of Nehemiah. The Embassy Fellowship Center Church is not just going to be built overnight unless we have the mind, heart, and...
spirit of Nehemiah, and we have to also be disciplined enough to say, I am going to push myself to the house of God. Why? I see what needs to be done, and I see the need at Embassy Fellowship Center, and I'm going to do my part. He said, he said, you see, you can't tell me you see. Listen, let me, let me, let me insert this. Say, insert it, preacher. Say, insert it, preacher. You can't, you can't see the misery we are in, and you are just having a don't care attitude or spirit. Every Sunday, when you get up to go to church, it's not that easy. David, every Sunday when you get up out of your buckhead mansion to come here, I'm putting your business out there. Let them know that you got it going on like that. <laughs> when you get up, do you know what the devil says to you? David, you know you got a stroke and you're struggling with this stroke. Where are you going, boy? Where are you going all the way up to marry her to hear the man with loud mouth? The devil is just trying to discourage you not to come. And you got to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to hear the word of God. One word may heal this body. Amen. Yes, class? Amen. When you get up on a Sunday morning, the devil is going to tell a girl, girl, you know you worked all week. You had all these customers all week. Uh, you know your business push it to the edge. Where you going? Just this girl, just one Sunday. You said no. You have to say, if I miss today, I think Josephine might miss. I think Jeffrey might miss. I think David might miss. Who will be in the house of God with my man of God? Always think about that. If I am missing, unless you are, come on class, sick unto but if you're not sick unto death, when the devil tells you, just, just, just take Sunday off. He said, no, because if I am off, so five others might be off too. They may not be disciplined enough to tell the body we're going to the house of God. Amen. So when the devil speaks to you to be absent, you say, no, I'm going to the house of God. And you sing that song all the way, I'm going to the house of God. On the way to church, I'm going to the house of God. Why? 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 Because you know the misery we are in. A lot of the members are still home comfortably. So you got to come here to make up the numbers. You got to come here to make up the difference. Because they don't see or understand the misery we are in. Had they known, they would be here. It's too obvious. Nehemiah said, you see. That means you know, you understand, you comprehend. It is too obvious. He said, even a blind man can see the problem and the misery we are in. Look what he says. He says, come, let us. We're in this together. We're in this together. I want you to understand, embassy, we are in this together. Those of you at home, we are in this together. If, you, if you're watching at home right now, you have to understand this, that we are in this together. And if you understand we are in this together, you're going to make an effort to do better. If you understand we are in this together, you will make an effort to do what? Do better. Yeah, Call no name. Get no. Please. Somebody in this church usually comes late. And one Sunday, the person came an extra early, earlier than they usually come. And after church, I said to the person, thanks for coming a little earlier this morning. He said, I'm trying. Amen. 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 Give me a high five, Jeffrey. <laughs> I, I ain't calling any name. But I, I let the person know I appreciate you. And the person said to me, I'm trying. Amen. He was honest enough to say, Pastor, I'm trying to come earlier. But I let him know. 
I appreciate you making that effort, Josephine, to come early. And he said, I'm trying. And that's my buddy, Jeffrey. Amen. You see the problem. You see the misery. He said, let's do something about it besides crying, complaining, worrying, being afraid, being intimidated. He said, let's do something about it. Look what he said. He said, now that I outline the problem, look what Nehemiah said. He didn't say stay home and be comfortably, comfortable. Now that he says how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire, he didn't say, it's too much for us to take this on right now. It's a whole lot. The entire Jerusalem is destroyed. He didn't say that. What did he say? He says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. We may no longer be an embarrassment. We may no longer, here's another word for reproach. Here's another word for reproach. It means disgrace. Why? Jerusalem was where God resides. The presence of God is. So let's say that's where God lives. I, 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 I just hate to share my business with you at times, especially when my sister is here because she doesn't like sometimes when I share my business. But I have to do it this morning. He says, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We're not going to be sitting down and crying anymore. We're not going to be worried about the safety anymore. We're not going to be worried about our peace of mind not here anymore. We're going to do something about it. Can we do something about rebuilding Embassy Fellowship Center after COVID-19, even though a lot of the members are not yet back? We are going to pray. We're going to come. We're going to give. We're going to invite. We're going to evangelize. We are going to build. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Nehemiah says, come. What are you going to do, Josephine? We're going to build. We're not going to stop. We're not going to cry. We're not going to give up. We're not going to say, it's a challenge. It's too hard. It's too much. It's too much of an undertaking. Nehemiah said, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem to get our security back. Our sense of hope is coming back if we build. It's not going to come if we just sit down and watch and hope and wish. And complain and gripe He's, and mope around. He says, no, we got to do something. We got to be bold enough, motivated enough, strong enough, encouraged enough to build the wall of Jerusalem. Remember I just said, I got to put my business out there. Jerusalem was where the presence of God resides, dwells. Yes, class? <laughs> I'm from the Caribbean Islands. And Jeffrey, I, I, I did not grow up rich like you in Maryland. We were dirt poor. We lived, for the first 15 years of my life, I live in this one room house. It's a one-room house. The living room became our bedroom at nights. One bed in the house for my stepdad and my mom. And it was not a real bed. It was a bed my stepfather made and get a sponge and put on it. So where did we sleep? Me, my sister, my two brothers, where did we sleep? We only have one bed in the house. We, we slept on the floor, the wooden floor. Follow me. We slept where? Wooden floor. We slept on old clothes that we refuse and don't wear anymore, or we wear them until they were worn out. They're no longer called clothes. 
they're called lodging. Because that's where we lodge. And we would spread them out on this wooden floor for four of us. That's where we slept at nights. In the daytime, your lodging has to be taken out the house to get air and sunshine. And we'll hang them on the fence. <laughs> One of the most embarrassing things for me was every day coming home from school and I have to see the lodging on the fence and my classmates and my friends seeing me sleeping on lodging. Everybody knows in the neighborhood I sleep on lodging because it's obvious it's, on, it's, it's right there on the fence. Look what Nehemiah says. He says, look what he says. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach means disgrace. Man, people made fun of me because I slept on lodging. It was, a, it, was, it was a disgrace for me, but that's the best my family could have done. I had a choice to run away or sleep on my lodging. I decided to sleep on my lodging. <laughs> I, I, I was not, I didn't have the American mentality to run away. I had to sleep on my lodging and deal with it. It was a disgrace. Because everybody in the neighborhood, they, they, they got to pass the road and they're going to see the color fence. Your fence is so colorful of lodging. So everybody knows. You see, there's a difference between clothes on the fence and clothes on the clothesline after you wash it. There's a distinction. They know those on the fence, on, or the, on the wire, the line, is from laundry. But those on the fence, that's, where they sleep, that's what they used to sleep on. So everybody in the neighborhood, and you better not mess with your friends and get your friends on your wrong side, because they'll tell you or remind you, you're sleeping lodging. And you don't, you don't know, because you slept on waterbed all your life, Josephine. You don't understand. You don't understand, Tamika. You slept on waterbed all your life. But sleeping and lodging in the Caribbean Islands is a disgrace. And Nehemiah says this. He says, let's do something about the lodging. So we no longer be a disgrace. At 15, I went to the Virgin Islands to live with my father, had my own bedroom. I thought I died, I went to heaven. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I had my own room, I had my own bed. I said, Lord have mercy, from lodging to my own room and a bed. No longer disgrace. I want to dance. I want to dance, Josephine, but my, feet is not, my foot is not completely healed yet. He says, let's do something about the broken down walls on the city gates that we may no longer be a disgrace. We may no longer be a reproach. Why? Nehemiah understood this is where God lives. Yes. And where God lives, we have to protect it. We have to do whatever it takes to bring back the reputation to Jerusalem, the place where God dwells and lives. And Nehemiah says, come let us, for us to save the disgrace of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. said we have to do something about it. Not God, we. Embassy is going to take all of us to do something about the growth of embassy, not God. We have to, Nehemiah says, come, let us build. But God will give us the strength, the strategy, and the will to do it. But we have to be willing. Am I making any sense at all, class? Amen. He says, come, let us build. I got five minutes. The wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be in reproach or disgrace. And it's, it's embarrassing now for majority of the church 
around the world because of course, since COVID-19. Since COVID-19. It's, 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 it's a disgrace. How did we lose our momentum? How did we lose our drive for the things of God and being in the house of God? How did we lose it? How, how did we allow COVID to overcome that passion we had for the house of God and being in the presence of God? How did we allow COVID-19 to have the victory? And we see nothing wrong with it. He said, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be in reproach. Turn to Psalm 133 real quick. Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Uh, we got to, I got three minutes. We have to shut it down, but we have to finish chapter th two. Hear what Psalms 133 says. Hear what it says. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garments. It is like dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing life forever. He said, it is running down the beard. Beard represents maturity. When somebody has beard, it means they are mature. You will never see a three-year-old kid, a seven-year-old kid having beard. But I used to have beard when I was at 11, 12, 13. You know how I had beard? Uh, when, the, when, the, when the barbers in the neighborhood cut our hair, I would get some glue, put it on here, and, glue, and I'll walk down the street like, no, I'm changing my voice. You know, hey, what's up, man? And I, I, I felt like I had beard. No, I wish I never had beard. Okay, you got to shave every morning. Annoying. But when I didn't have beard, I was trying to get beard. And David, I wish I never had beard. <laughs> ah, you hearing me, somebody? Beard represents maturity. God wants the body of Christ, the church of God, to get to the place of maturity so we can build after COVID-19. He said it's a good thing how precious it is when brothers dwell together in unity. There's nothing like coming together in unity. Being in person is a whole different vibe and energy. I, I want to give you, oh, Jesus, we've got to move quickly. Go to verse 18 of um, Nehemiah. Verse 18. Verse 18 says this, And I told them the good hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. That's two things he's listing so far. He said, So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. It's a good work we're doing. Anything that we're doing for God is good, even though we're going to have challenges, opposition, Satan coming at us to discourage us and to stop us. It's still a good work. Hear this. I told them, now, he's trying to motivate them because he knows that they lost a sense of hope. They lost a sense of security. Uh, they're discouraged. It's a lot of work to be done. So Nehemiah, after he said, let's rise up and build, let's build the wall, he now tried to motivate and encourage them. So this is what he said to them. Look at verse 18. And I told them, he had to tell them something to let them know we can do this. He said what? And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. He said, man, God is with me. I've got God backing. He said, Leah, I have God's backing. If you have God's backing, doesn't matter how big the task is, God will see you through and see us through. 
He's, he, listen, they are discouraged. They lost a sense of hope. They lost a sense of security. And all of a sudden, he said to them, God's hand is upon me. It means we are going to have victory. It's a lot of work to be done. It's hard. It's a challenge. But he said, we can do this because God's hand is upon me. What else did he say? He said, the hand of God is upon me. And something else he said, he says, I have the backing of the king's words. The king is behind us. The king is behind us. We have the financial backing. We have the support, the protection. We can do this. And after he motivated them by giving them a story, by saying, God's hands is upon me. The king words are behind us. The people all of a sudden got encouraged. And what did they say? They said, let us rise up and build. They got motivated. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Jesus grew in stature and wisdom with man. He grew in stature and Wisdom, favor, he had the favor, right? And right here, Nehemiah is saying, I've got the favor of God and the king. I have the favor of? What is favor? Favor is you don't have to work for it. It falls in your lap. Favor is when you don't have to work for it, David. It falls, it stumbles into your lap. That's favor. Doors open for you, swinging on the hinges of success. Look. Look at this. You remember what David said to Goliath? Goliath was bigger, taller, stronger, more experienced. David was a 17-year-old kid, inexperienced, not as big and strong as Goliath. But David said, I killed a lion and a bear. Who do you think you are, you uncircumcised Philistine? He said, I killed a lion and a bear with my hands. If I did that, I can take you down. Nehemiah said, I have God's backing. His hand is upon me, and I have the king's word. We can do this. David said, I killed a lion and a bear. I can take you down, Goliath. Can we do this at embassy? I think we can. We've been doing it since three years now, since we've been back in person. And we're still standing. We can do this. Tamika, we can do this. Tamika, you're coming every Sunday motivated, O.D. Joseph. Leah, you're coming motivated me. Jeffrey, you're coming. David, you're coming. Josephine, my family's coming motivated me to come every Sunday. We can do this. Look at verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, official, and Geshem the Arab heard, it, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us. And said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? The, Nehemiah was not rebelling against the king. They were just trying to intimidate him. You're rebelling against the king because when you rebel against the king, you can suffer the consequences. So trying to intimidate Nehemiah, you are rebelling. No, Nehemiah, no, I've got the backing of the king. I'm not rebelling. I, the king is behind me. And not only that, God is behind me. Look, I want to give you the definition of, of, of Sanballat, enemy in secret. It also means strong. Nehemiah, I'm sorry, Sanballat was the leading opposition opponent of the Jews at this time. Enemy in secret. Sometimes... You have to be so cautious because the enemy is in secret. You can't figure out where the enemy is. It takes a while. 
And you got to be strategic and trust God and believe for the hand of God to be upon you to do what you're doing, especially when the enemy is in secret. Class, are you awake? Okay. Now, Nehemiah, Sanballat, enemy in secret. Tobiah, God is good or goodness of God. You'll be surprised the very same people who say God is good are the ones who are hurting the church. They're not coming, they're not supporting, they're not praying, they have, no, they, they have lost the interest, and they're still saying God is good. And they're hurting the move of God, yes? yes. Last one, last one. You know, go, go back to Nehemiah 2 verse 19. There are three guys mentioned, Sanballat, Tobiah, What's the other guy's name? Gisham. Gisham. You know, you know what Gisham means? You know what Gisham means, Claire? It means rain. It means? So you have one sun ballot, enemy secret. You have Tobiah means what? God is good. Then now you have, what a combination. Now you have Gisham means rain. Have you ever heard the term, I, I, I will rain on your parade? Right. Yeah. Gishem and these guys come to rain on Nehemiah's parade. Meaning, rain on somebody's parade mean what? You're trying to block them, hinder them. You're not blocking them on Facebook, blocking them in person. When you tell somebody, I'm going to rain on your parade, they're trying to tell you, I'm trying to hinder you, stop you, slow you down, and prevent you from doing what you're doing. And here was Gisham trying to rain on Nehemiah's parade, preventing Nehemiah from rebuilding the wall and the city gates, but it didn't stop Nehemiah. Why? Nehemiah was too focused. Nehemiah was? I would like for embassy... Don't get discouraged. Don't let the seats, empty seats, discourage you. Don't let those who are not coming discourage you. You come and watch God bless you. Because if you don't come, I'll take your blessing. And I'll be very selfish to give it to you. Yes, class? Look, let's wrap it up. Uh, Nehemiah was not rebelling. He had the backing of God. The protection of God, the hand of God upon him, the king's backing. But here comes these three guys trying to stop him, trying to intimidate him, trying to rain on his parade, meaning trying to stop him from rebuilding the wall. But that did not stop Nehemiah. Don't allow anything to stop you from coming here on a Sunday morning. Amen. Yes, class? Yes. Uh, when I got back from St. Lucia, Sunday morning I got out to come to the house of the Lord. I start my car. The car wouldn't start. The car told me, I'm not starting. You ain't going nowhere. I just called my sister. I said, pull up next to my car for me, please. Pulled up my jumper cable, jumped the car, and I was in the house of God. You know what somebody else from embassy would have said? Pastor! My <laughs> I got in the car this morning, would not start. The devil is a liar. And I'm still here trying to fight with this car that refused to start. Honey, if you want to start the car to get into the house of God, you will get the car start. you got to have the mind, spirit, and heart of Nehemiah. Nothing stops you. I told my sister, pull up alongside this bad boy here for me. Open that hood and get some jumper cables. And I was in the house of God on that Sunday morning. Amen, somebody. Don't allow anything to stop you. I could have easily said... Golly, I'm the preacher. The devil just after me. Oh, the whole bunch. I don't know what the devil. I don't know what the devil wants with me. I, I could be complaining, or I can just rise up and do what can be done. Ain't no time to complain. Listen, when you complain, the devil is not going to back down. He's not going to feel sorry for you. He's not going to run in the corner and say, Golly, I'm tired of messing with Leah. Just leave her alone. She's crying. She's, she's, she's frustrated. The devil is going to just run you into a dry river when you cry. The devil is not going to back down when you cry or when you complain. The devil is going to come and push you more in a dry river. 
You can cry all you want, complain all you want. The devil is not going to say, okay, I'll come back next week when you stop crying. Uh -uh. No, the devil likes when you cry. The devil likes when you get the blues, but the devil hates when you're on your knees. Yeah. Let's wrap it up, verse 20. So I answered them. Nehemiah is answering those three hooligans. Those three guys are trying to rain on his parade. Verse 20. So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. <laughs> hey, you've got to tell the devil, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. He will see us through. As hard as, as, as hard and as difficult it might be, God will see us through as long as we don't quit. As long as we don't get intimidated. As long as we don't back down from the enemy's trials and attacks. you got to keep going. Look at this. He said, the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. We've got God on our side, but you don't have him on your side. That's what Nehemiah told them. We have God on our side, but you don't. You three hooligans, you don't have God's protection and backing, but we have him. And he will see us through. He will prosper us as long as we don't give up. Weeping may endure for how long? But joy comes in the morning. You've got to endure until morning to get the results and the success. Yes, class? Weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. And the same thing, even though we are in misery at embassy, we are going to go through and see God's hand of victory upon us. He said, God will prosper us. Nehemiah knew his God. When we know our God, we know what he can do. We keep on holding on until victory comes.